started. It is two o'clock on the nose. All right. Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar, Partnering to Digitize Georgia's Historic Newspapers, which is brought to you by Georgia Home Place, a project of the Georgia Public Library Service and the Digital Library of Georgia. Slides and documents from today's event can be found at the URL on your screen, which is bit.ly or bit.ly forward slash 2K9 GQDN. My name is Angela Stanley and I am Director of Georgia Home Place for GPLS. We are so pleased to bring you this webinar. If you have a question or would like to provide feedback about the series, please complete the survey that you will be directed to following the webinar's conclusion. If you're unfamiliar with the Georgia Public Library Service, we're Georgia's state library and part of the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia. We provide services and resources to Georgia's 62 public library systems, and we partner with leading institutions like the Digital Library of Georgia to democratize access to digitization technologies and cultural heritage content. I encourage you to check out both our websites and explore some of the many resources available to you. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be made available in multiple places. You can check out any of the links on your screen. These links will be emailed to all participants once the recording is available. Additionally, continuing education credit is available for those participants that require it. You can contact Dorcas Davis at ddavis at georgialibraries.org to request a certificate. Lastly, we ask that you please save the date for our upcoming events. Uh, we have a webinar coming up called Getting Your Needs Met, Evaluating Library Technologies and Library Vendors, taking place September 19th, 2019 at 2 p.m. Atlanta University Center Digital Initiatives Librarian Cliff Landis will demonstrate project management techniques for evaluating and selecting library technologies and the vendors who support them. You'll learn how to break large projects into smaller chunks, focus on documentation to reduce miscommunication and missteps, and hold both vendors and team members accountable for deliverables. Don't miss it. Registration is available at the link on your screen. And the DLG's 2019-2020 subgranting program is underway. This program funds up to $7,500 in digitization services for Georgia cultural heritage institutions. Additional details are available at the link on your screen and the application deadline is October 1st. All right, now on to today's webinar. I am pleased to welcome our presenter, Donnie Summerlin. Donnie is the Digital Projects Archivist at the Digital Library of Georgia, where he oversees their ongoing efforts to digitize the state's historic newspapers. He has a BA in History from the University of Georgia, an MA in History from the Georgia College and State University, an MLIS from Valdosta State, and has been a certified archivist since 2010. Donnie is happy to take questions throughout the presentation. Simply type them into the chat box as they arise, and we'll be sure to address them as time allows. And now I'm going to hand it over to Donnie for his presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for attending this webinar on partnering to digitize Georgia's historic newspapers. I've been working on newspaper digitization at the Digital Library of Georgia, or the DLG, uh, for the last 12 years. And during that time, uh, we've been working to continually explore new approaches to newspaper digitization to make the materials available online faster and in more standardized ways. Uh, today, I'm going to give you an overview of the Digital Library of Georgia's current newspaper digitization process. Then I'll talk to you about things to think about when considering partnering with the DLG, Georgia Home Place, and Georgia Public Library Service to digitize your local newspapers. Uh, if you have questions along the way, like Angela said, um, please feel free to do so, and I'll also be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So to start out, I'm gonna spend a little time describing the Digital Library of Georgia's newspaper digitization process. The three main procedural points are that we digitize from master negative microfilm, we follow National Digital Newspaper Program, or NDNP, digitization standards, 
and we host the papers on our Georgia Historic Newspapers website. The fastest and least expensive way to digitize newspapers is to digitize them from the microfilm. Uh, luckily, the Georgia Newspaper Project, or the GNP, has been microfilming newspapers since the 1950s and is a division of the DLG. Uh, many of you have uh, microfilm holdings of a local newspaper at your public library. This film was likely produced by the GNP. For digitization, however, we don't use public access film from the public libraries because the wear and tear on public film reduces the quality of digital scans and also reduces keyword searching accuracy. For that reason, we use the master negative microfilm collection at the GNP. That film is in pristine condition and hasn't been touched by the public. And the result is the production of sharp images that produce accurate search results. And using this master negative film helps us meet Library of Congress digitization standards. So as I just mentioned, the DLG digitizes newspapers according to the Library of Congress's NDNP standards. This standard is used by dozens of state programs around the country to digitize and present newspapers online and is widely considered the national standard for newspaper digitization. When we digitize newspapers, we create what are referred to as newspaper batches. Those batches contain the images, uh, which include TIFFs, JPEG 2000s, and PDFs. They also include the OCR files that make uh, word searches possible. And uh, they also include metadata files, structural and descriptive. And all of this is organized in a standardized file structure that's set by the Library of Congress and works with our online platform. So an added benefit to this is that we're able to carry out this process either in-house or with vendors, depending on the situation. So let me take just a minute to talk to you about the benefits of following these NDNP standards to digitize newspapers. The images that come out of this process are of superior quality. They're 400 DPI, uncompressed, grayscale TIFF images. And this makes the text easily readable and also improves the OCR and search results. There are cheaper methods for digitizing newspapers, but they utilize bitonal compressed images and they don't produce the accurate search results you get from following these kind of high standards. And producing accurate search results is really the top demand of people using online newspaper archives. Um, a kind of a fun example of these high quality images is this great clipping from a 1965 issue of the Jackson Progress Argus in Butts County that's available through our website. It lists the citizens of Jackson, Georgia who attended a Beatles concert in Atlanta that year during the height of Beatlemania. And uh, this is kind of why I love newspapers so much. You can't find this kind of history elsewhere. It really was the social media before social media. And following rigorous digitization standards result in accurate searches that make finding clippings like this possible. So the best part of NDNP standards is that the news, at least the best part for me, is that the newspapers uh, can be included in the Georgia Historic Newspapers website, along with nearly 1.4 million other Georgia newspaper pages and growing. This makes it the most convenient place for users to find and search through newspapers from Georgia. So let me tell you a little bit more about the site. Once the digitization process is complete, we upload the newspapers into the Georgia Historic Newspapers website, which you see here on the slide. Uh, the DLG and Galileo design, designed this site about two years ago based on the Library of Congress's Cronam platform. The site contains every newspaper ever digitized by the DLG, which accounts for nearly 1.4 million pages of newspaper content that are keyword searchable with hit highlighting and can be browsed by date, title, region, city, county, and newspaper type. And the site is freely available to the public and works in every browser and operating system without the use of plugins or software. And the site's one of the largest collections of online newspapers in the country. And over the last 12 months, uh, we've had over 6 million page views on the site. So if your local newspaper is added to the site, it's going to receive more exposure and use than it might on other websites. So in addition to making these digitized newspapers available online, we preserve them in the University of Georgia's Preservation Storage Repository. And this means that the images will be kept safe and made available for future generations. 
So uh, the Digital Library of Georgia and Georgia Home Place also, once they're uh, loaded into the site, help promote the release of the newspapers through press releases and social media. So when I tell people all of this about our methodology and our site, they say, yeah, yeah, that's great. But when are you going to add my local newspaper to the site? And that's where the second part of this webinar comes in. Okay, so are you interested in participating? Let's take a look at what you'll need to consider if you want to partner with the Digital Library of Georgia and Georgia Home Place to digitize and add a newspaper to the Georgia Historic Newspapers website. At the beginning of the process, you'll want to come up with a project scope. Specifically, what newspaper titles and years do you want to see digitized? Before making any decisions, uh, it's a good idea to first visit the Georgia Historic Newspapers website to make sure we haven't already digitized titles you're interested in. We're constantly adding new titles and you want to make sure that uh, we haven't already digitized something uh, to affect your project scope. Um, the website available is available at gahistoricnewspapers.galileo.usg.edu um, and I'll have that URL at the end of the slide presentation. Um, you might also want to visit the Digital Library of Georgia and perform a search for your newspaper titles there to make sure some other organization hasn't already digitized them as well. Uh, you'll also want to consider the significance of local newspapers when selecting titles and date ranges as part of your scope. Was it the paper of record? Did it give voice to an underrepresented group? Is there a title with particular demand from local users? After you've determined uh, that your titles of interest aren't available online and which titles are most significant from your area, the other major factors to consider when setting up a project scope include microfilm availability, copyright laws, funding, and scheduling. And I'll go over each of these considerations individually. So uh, microfilm availability is one of the earliest considerations. As previously mentioned, the DLG digitizes predominantly from the master negative microfilm holdings of the Georgia Newspaper Project, the GNP. This will affect what can and can't be digitized. You'll need to investigate what has been microfilmed by the GNP before settling on a project scope. Questions you'll want to consider are, are the titles you're interested in available on microfilm at the GNP? If a title is available, what date ranges are available on microfilm? Is the microfilm available for your title of interest produced by a commercial entity like Bell & Howard instead of the GNP? Uh, if so, we won't have access to the master film and probably won't be able to digitize it from a publicly used copy of the film. Um, you might also consider page counts. Uh, how many pages are on a run of microfilm dates? That number can depend on whether a title was published weekly, triweekly, or daily. If you select a weekly paper for your project, you'll be able to digitize a wider range of dates at a lower page count and cost. Selecting a daily newspaper for digitization, on the other hand, will lead to a larger page count for a shorter range of dates. That doesn't mean you shouldn't select a daily newspaper. Um, they're full of in-depth information that researchers love, but they can be more costly. It all depends on your available funding. Um, the number of pages on the microfilm is what will ultimately affect the cost of digitization. So if you're interested in digitizing a title, the DLG is able and willing to prepare these page counts for you. So all of the information related to microfilm availability, including page counts, can be provided to you from Georgia Home Place and the Digital Library of Georgia. You just have to contact us. Um, we have on occasion worked with partners who have paper holdings of a newspaper that haven't been microfilmed. In those cases, the newspapers can either be microfilmed by the Georgia Newspaper Project before they're digitized, or you can work with a vendor to have the paper copies digitized directly before they go through the rest of the process. If you choose the latter, uh, please contact us first so we can give you the specifications to make sure they're digitized in a manner that meets Library of Congress standards and that we're able to include them in the Georgia Historic Newspapers website. So funding is another consideration. Digitizing newspapers can be a costly process and can affect what you're able to digitize. Many libraries uh, that have partnered with Home Place and the DLG have scoped the size of their project based largely on how much funding they're able to secure. 
for example, the library will have $5,000 to spend, let's say, and that will allow them to digitize their local paper, say, from 1880 to 1905. Other institutions have set a project scope and then raised the money to meet that goal project through grants or fundraising. An example would be if a library wanted to digitize their paper from its founding in 1878 through 1920, they would need to sit, raise, say, $9,000, that kind of thing. So it costs approximately 74 cents per page to digitize, host, and preserve historical newspapers. And our partners have secured funding to cover this digitization in a number of ways. Some have been able to cover the cost of newspaper digitization through their own institutional budgets. Uh, this is a simple solution, but it's not always an option for every organization. For those who don't have room in their budgets, applying for local grants is also an option as is fundraising in your community. Uh, examples of this with past partners include a public library who received a grant from a power company who has a Roundup program that funds local projects. They then use the money to partner with us to digitize their local newspaper and include it on the Georgia Historic Newspapers website. Um, there are also several Georgia-based foundations that have funded newspaper digitization partnerships with us, uh, including the Watson Brown Foundation, for example. So you might consider applying for grants uh, or holding a fundraiser to help finance the cost of newspaper digitization. Uh, a quick note on this, uh, if you are considering applying for a grant, uh, we ask you please contact us. We'd be happy to uh, provide you with all the information you need to help you fill out the application forms. Um, some partners have gone directly to newspaper publishers to seek financial assistance in digitizing their newspapers. Uh, depending on the publisher, they may be interested in working uh, with their local library to help fund the digitization of the paper and making it available online. Uh, it really just depends on the publisher. Uh, finally, Georgia Home Place can be a valuable resource for connecting you with possible sources of funding. Home Place Director Angela Stanley has uh, had great success working with public libraries to digitize newspapers with the DLG. Okay, copyright. So another consideration that can affect your project scope is copyright law. Uh, if a newspaper is under copyright and distribution permission isn't secured from the copyright holder, uh, we aren't able to digitize it and put it online. I provided for you here a simplified breakdown of copyright restrictions as it relates to newspapers. Um, none of this should be taken as legal advice because I'm certainly no copyright law expert but it'll help give you a general idea of what you're dealing with. Um, Pre-1924 newspapers, as you can see there, are in the public domain and no permissions are needed to put them online. That's why I'm able to put this Michelin ad from 1917 in this presentation without permission. By the way, uh, the public domain now moves forward uh, one year every January. So this January, everything published in 1924 will fall into the public domain. In the January after that, 1925 works will fall into the public domain. Um, and it, theoretically, it will keep moving forward that way until Congress changes the current set of copyright laws. So newspapers, as of this year, newspapers from 1924 to 1977 may be in copyright or may be in the public domain. It depends on whether copyright notices were printed in the paper and whether those copyrights were registered or renewed. If you're interested in digitizing papers from this time period, you would either need to secure permission from the copyright holder or conduct a copyright investigation to see if it's fallen into the public domain. Um, copyright investigations can produce results that demonstrate some of the post-1923 issues of a paper have fallen into the public domain, but securing permission from the copyright holder is usually faster, less expensive, and more certain. And then finally, any newspapers published after 1977 are probably under copyright protection and would require permission from the copyright holder before they could be digitized. Uh, this may seem daunting, but many of our partners have had success securing permission from newspaper publishers, uh, particularly when those requests come from a local organization like a public library. Uh, the Digital Library of Georgia can provide you with a permission to distribute form that will uh, allow you uh, 
it will, you can send that form to a newspaper publisher to be signed, and that will grant permission for it to be uh, placed online without the publisher losing any of their copyright protections. Uh, this can get tricky if a newspaper is no longer in business. Uh, tracking down a copyright holder in that situation uh, can be a challenge and may prevent you from considering a newspaper for digitization. Um, Cornell University has a great set of tables that go into more depth on when a work falls into the public domain. I've got the URL there at the bottom of the slide. It's kind of tiny. If you can't read it, it's copyright.cornell.edu slash public domain. And it's a great resource for helping you to understand uh, copyright. Um, so these copyright restrictions may affect the scope of your project. If you aren't able to secure permission from a newspaper publisher, you may consider limiting your project to newspapers published through 1923 and revisiting uh, future years of a title at a later date. Just all depends. Okay, so project scheduling. Uh, the timing of a project is also an important factor when considering a partnership to digitize newspapers with the DLG. Uh, there are a number of things to consider, including the size of the project you're interested in. Uh, large projects will, of course, take longer to complete. And if a project is too large, it may have to be divided into different phases that are completed over several years. Um, you'll also want to consider the number of projects currently scheduled at the DLG. Uh, we're constantly working on multiple newspaper projects, and so the timing of a project may be affected uh, by the number of uh, projects currently on, your, on our docket. So uh, sometimes projects have to be scheduled for uh, up to a year in advance. And that's where uh, fiscal year and completion deadlines come in. You'll have to figure out if you need to spend money by a certain date and have a project complete by a certain date to meet budgetary restrictions or grant guidelines. Finally, you'll want to consider vendor availability, or rather we'll want to consider it. Um, we often use vendors to complete portions of the digitization process, and their availability may affect uh, when you're able to schedule a project with us. So Donnie, main... we've, had a, we've had a quick question in the chat box. I'd like to just interject real quick. Of course. Um, so somebody is asking whether other organizations such as historical societies can pursue putting their local newspapers online in addition to public libraries. Oh yeah, definitely. We've worked with several uh, historical organizations. Um, some of them have uh, funded it through their own uh, budgets and through the uh, dues of their own members. Others have been able to apply for grants. But yeah, we've worked with organizations of all different types. We've worked with public libraries, we've worked with archives, historical societies, religious organizations. Uh, there's really no limit on the type of partner we're willing to work with to help digitize newspapers. So it's definitely not limited to public libraries. Does that uh, answer your question? Hopefully. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat box, but thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, so, in regard to project scheduling, uh, the main point to take away from this is that it's important not to make any budget or deadline commitments until you've discussed the timing of the project with the DLG and Georgia Home Place to make sure that we can meet your needs. So, um, in summary, if you're considering a partnership with the Digital Library of Georgia and Georgia Home Place to digitize newspapers, the factors you'll want to think about include the project scope, namely the title and years you're interested in digitizing. Uh, you'll want to make your project selections based on a number of factors, uh, including microfilm availability at the Georgia Newspaper Project, uh, copyright protections of the newspapers you're interested in digitizing. Uh, this may affect the range of dates you select in your project scope. You'll want to consider funding availability and how to secure that funding and also project scheduling, including when the DLG is available to take on a project, and also taking into account your own financial and completion deadlines. So here are a few links uh, for the Georgia Historic Newspaper site and the Digital Library of Georgia. Uh, the Georgia Historic Newspaper site has a participation page, and you can find the Participate tab in the upper right-hand corner of the site. And there you'll find some of the information I presented today, 
um, as well as links to other resources to help you plan um, newspaper digitization. Um, I also have a link up here for uh, Chronicling America on the slide, which is the Library of Congress's newspaper archive. It currently contains approximately 100,000 of our Georgia newspaper pages produced by us from Savannah and Brunswick, along with over 10 million other newspaper pages from around the country. Um, it's a great resource and uh, we're still a partner in producing newspapers for that website and for that program. And uh, if you want to keep up with what we're working on, you can get updates from our Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as the Digital Library of Georgia blog. So uh, if you have questions or you're interested in participating, uh, you can contact Angela Stanley at Georgia Home Place. Uh, she works with public libraries and the Digital Library of Georgia to help make these partnerships happen. And you can also contact me, Donnie Summerlin, at the Digital Library of Georgia. I'm happy to answer any newspaper-related questions you might have. And if you're interested, we can also uh, put you in touch with some of our previous partners so they can talk with you about their experiences partnering with us to digitize newspapers. And like I said, those partners range from public libraries to historical and genealogical societies. Um, we've worked with uh, museums. We've worked with religious organizations. Uh, we've even taken individual donors uh, from time to time. Uh, we've worked with individual donors. So um, there's no limit to the type of organizations that we can work with to uh, get these newspapers online. So uh, all that being said, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, for those of you that aren't staying for the questions, uh, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Donnie. Um, we have had another question here. Um, so the question reads, um, regarding microfilm, we have papers between 1982 and 1992, and we know that the holdings on microfilm are sketchy. Would I have to look at each microfilm reel to determine if we have issues that are not microfilmed? Uh, yes. <laughs> It seems uh, labor intensive, and it is labor intensive, but uh, if you have paper holdings and you want to match them to the current holdings on a reel of microfilm, uh, the best way to do it is to have someone record the dates of each and match them up. It sounds kind of old school, but that's the best way to go about it because microfilm's old school. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I have another question. Uh, what's the current weight for digitizing at the DLG? Uh, well, I would say uh, for this fiscal year, um, which for us runs from, I believe, uh, July through June, uh, we are pretty full of projects. So any new projects that we would take on uh, would most likely um, be for the following fiscal year, which means we would start next summer on it. Um, there are exceptions depending on um, the necessity to use money, et cetera, but we're pretty booked up for this fiscal year in terms of newspaper projects. All right. Uh, another question, if you have part of a collection digitized, but there were errors, can it be done again? Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> okay, so it's something that we've digitized or someone else has digitized? Uh, by an outside vendor. Oh, by an outside vendor. Okay. Um, it would depend on how it was digitized. So... Um, if you mean if you mean another organization has um, digitized it and put it online, um, we're really not limited to only digitizing stuff that's never been digitized as long as there's funding available. So uh, hypothetically speaking, let's say an organization paid to have uh, a newspaper title digitized um, by another group, as long as they don't have contractual restrictions and they're willing to fund the digitization again, I don't see any reason why we couldn't digitize them and add them to our own site. Um, you know, another consideration would be what sort of images were, pro uh, were um, produced from that previous project. Um, there's a chance that 
if you own those images, there's a chance that they were produced according to standards that would allow us to digitize them or send them through the process so we can ingest them into our own site. It would just depend on the quality of the images. And uh, yeah, if you have a sp more specific questions about that, please feel free to contact me. I'm glad to, to go into more depth with you about that. Thanks, Donnie. Sure. All right, and we've got another question. Uh, if you have local newspapers on microfilm and the newspapers date from 1917 to 2005, and the newspaper is currently active, can you place the 1917 to 1923 papers online with their permission? You can place those newspapers online without their permission. So um, if the newspaper still exists, it, it started in 1917. Uh, once anything that uh, was published from 1923 backwards is freely available to be used by anyone for any reason. It's in the public domain. So you wouldn't require permission from anybody to publish that um, range of dates, 1917 to 1923. You can move forward with that without any permission at all. Now, if you wanted to do anything past 1923, you would either need to get permission from the publisher or, um, or conduct a copyright investigation. I would suggest contacting, if you're interested in post-1923 papers, I would suggest contacting the publisher first. Um, to see if they're interested in um, providing permission, because that's, like I said, that's the fastest, cheapest, and most certain way of getting permission. Um, but if you're talking about 1917 to 1923, no permission at all is needed on that. Awesome. I am not seeing any additional questions in the chat box at this point. So this is an invitation to type your final questions. Um, Donnie, maybe while we're waiting on those last couple of questions to come through, um, would you mind uh, just talking real briefly about what functionality is available in the GHN if folks haven't had a chance to look through it? What can they, what can they do and how can they expect to be able to use the site? Sure. Uh, so the GHN website, which is kind of our abbreviation for the Georgia Historic Newspapers website, uh, allows users to perform keyword searches with hit highlighting. We also have uh, a search page that allows you to search by title, by any specific date and range you want. And we have newspapers available from Georgia's very first newspaper in the 1600s all the way through, I think, 2015 maybe, very recent newspapers. Um, but most of the content is pre-1923. Um, so you can perform searches by title, by city, by county, by date, by region. It gives you a lot of different options for searching. Words that are within five words of each other, words that are within two words of each other. It can get very specific. It allows you to have very specific searches. Um, you can also browse newspapers. Uh, I believe we have over 400 different titles currently available on the site, and you can browse through them by county, by city, by um, date, by the number of issues available, by region. Um, you can look through newspapers by type, so we have different types. So uh, we have a different classification for school newspapers and for religious newspapers and for African American newspapers. And so you can browse through titles based on those classifications. Um, we also have what are, we refer to as regional pages. So it will allow you to browse and search just in different regions. And so that way it kind of emulates our old sites if people prefer to use a site by region it will allow you to search and browse by region, North Georgia, West Georgia, et cetera. Um, we have, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so uh, it also allows you to clip pages. Um, so if you're interested in just portions of a newspaper page, you can clip portions of it. You can view the OCR text in case you're interested in just looking at the actual text and not the image of the page. You can look at the OCR. You can download a PDF of the newspaper page in case you want to save a, a PDF of the page. Uh, it's a pretty, sounds like bragging, but it's a pretty state-of-the-art site. It's based off the Library of Congress's site, but we have a great programming team. 
and they were able to customize updates based on user preferences. And so it's a pretty great site. And the best part is that it has almost uh, a million, it, by next year it will have a million and a half newspaper pages in it. And so it's kind of a one-stop shop for people interested in researching uh, Georgia newspapers. Uh, it's a pretty great site. Thanks, Donnie. We've had a couple of uh, questions come through in the interim. Um, so first I'll start with uh, what is the, so it looks like the question is, what is the process to um, obtain a vendor to microfilm physical extant papers? Okay, so um, if you have uh, physical papers that haven't been microfilmed, I think that's what you mean, right? So, uh, yeah, I think she's got uh, paper copy newspapers that she would right. like to see microfilmed. Sure, okay. So uh, if you'd like to see it microfilmed, you could actually contact us here. The Georgia Newspaper Project um, digitizes um, historical papers and also current papers. And so um, that might be the first place to check um, it would be with our Georgia Newspaper uh, Project, which is part of the DLG. And we could see if we could make, uh, if we could microfilm those papers. And once they've been microfilmed, they could be digitized. Now, if you're not interested in the microfilm and you just want to see them digitized, we can recommend vendors that our partners have used um, where they've sent the papers off and they've been scanned directly from the paper. So those are really your two options if you have paper um, newspapers that haven't, <laughs> it's repetitive, paper newspapers that haven't been microfilmed yet. But I would start with uh, checking with us in the Georgia news because in the Georgia newspaper project because uh, they may be able to microfilm your papers. Awesome, thanks. Uh, next question is: um, Can the Georgia newspaper, uh, or sorry, can the GHN accommodate a continual or revolving account to digitize current newspapers as they're being published? Oh, I see. Um, so. Um, that's something we're actually investigating right now would be uh, working with newspaper publishers to uh, ingest uh, their digital files. It's not something that um, that's on the horizon right now. It's kind of in the investigatory stages, um, but uh, it is something that we're looking at, which would be ingesting more recent material directly from newspaper publishers. But like I said, that's kind of in the planning processes right now. Um, if there's an organization out there that would like to um, digitize it from very recent microfilm. Um, I guess the Georgia Newspaper Project is probably about a year behind when they microfilm stuff that's on standing order. So it could be uh, digitized that way. Um, but yeah, we're still in the, in the planning process and trying to figure that out right now. Awesome. Um, another comment, uh, I love the site. Is work being done to have search results be more accurate when the user asks, oops, when the user asks for the words to be within one or two words of one another? Right, so the way the site works right now is when you search for two words that are within one word of each other, it will, it will only produce pages that have those two words within one word of each other, but the highlighting is what throws people off. The highlighting will also highlight all other instances of that word on the page. So you can count on, if you use it, I believe, I've tested this before, if you uh, type uh, two words into the box and say you want it separated by one word, it should only produce pages that have that somewhere on the page. You just have to find it amongst all the other highlighted uh, words that aren't next to each other on the page, if that makes sense. But uh, in, in regard to your question of, are we looking to improve the site? We're always looking to improve the site. Um, we take user suggestions all the time and talk with our programmers. And it's actually pretty common if it's feasible for us to make changes to the site based on user recommendations. Our programming team is always really open to suggestions. So we do constantly take um, feedback from users and incorporate it into the site. There are, of course, limitations because we're using, um, we're using a, a platform that was designed by the Library of Congress and there are limitations to how we can change it. But if it's possible, we're always open to it. Well, following up on that, uh, somebody would like to know how much of the GHN content is on Chronicling America? 
um, about 100,000 pages of it. And those are the, uh, so the way, what happened is we got the National Digital Newspaper Program grant from the Library of Congress, and that grant allowed us to digitize over 100,000 pages of materials using Library of Congress funding. And that, those materials were ingested both into our site and into their site. And so this, our stuff accounts for about 100,000 pages on the Library of Congress's Chronicling America site. Um, and uh, hopefully if we get future grants, we'll be able to continually add new papers both to our site and to uh, the Library of Congress's site, but all of our legacy stuff, so in other words, the million or so pages that we digitized before we got the grant, none of that's eligible currently to be added to the Chronicling America site. And that's not unique to us, that's uh, their general rule. So any other state, say New York or Texas or any of these other states that have digitized over a million pages of content, none of their stuff pre-grant is eligible for ingestion right now either. Um, that may change in the future, I don't know, maybe after the grant's over, because all of our newspapers have been um, retrofitted uh, to that standard, but currently it's only newspapers that are produced during the grant period that are ingested into the national site. So it's uh, I, right now, as of now, it's the Savannah Morning News, uh, the Brunswick News, the Brunswick Times. Those are the three titles that you'll find from us in the Chronicling America website. Hopefully that made sense. Thanks, Donnie. Sure. Uh, Okay, so if someone had uh, newspapers that were microfilmed in color, would, or maybe the better way to phrase this is, what is uh, the GHN requirements in terms of color or black and white images? Will they, uh, we have or grayscale? No requirements either way. We are able to ingest color images. We're able to ingest black and white images. Uh, the important thing is that uh, the images, well, if they're on microfilm, it won't affect it, but the color or black and white uh, have no uh, bearing on whether we're able to ingest them or not. They just have to be scanned and, and um, batched according to standards, but color has no effect on it. So if you have color microfilm, we could definitely digitize that. Awesome. Uh, what does it mean if years of Our Town's newspaper appear in the Georgia Newspaper Project microfilm list? Does that mean that they've been digitized? Uh, if they're in the Georgia Newspaper Projects um, microfilm list, it doesn't mean that they're digitized. It only means that they're microfilmed. Um, because uh, the Georgia Newspaper Project has probably microfilmed. Uh, it's got to be over 10 million pages. And we've only uh, digitized about a million and a half pages. So there's so much more content that's been microfilmed that we'll need to digitize going forward. But if it's been microfilmed and it's on their list, it doesn't mean we've digitized it. If you're interested in what we've digitized, you can visit the site and see our list of titles. Uh, is color microfilm a lot more expensive than black and white? That's a good question. I don't know. That's a question for the folks down at the Georgia Newspaper Project. Um, we don't produce color film in-house here. I imagine it would have to be more expensive just because of the different inks involved. Um, but as for first-hand knowledge, I don't know. That's a good question. I imagine it has to be. All right. If you do have questions about that, um, if you'll contact me, I can put you in contact with other people who might be able to answer that question. Uh, so the question is, can you apply or appeal to have uh, papers that have already been microfilmed digitized? So, for example, if uh, they don't have the microfilm or the institution doesn't have the microfilm, but UGA does. Okay, so if we have the microfilm, but they don't have the microfilm? Correct. And they want to see it digitized? Yeah, that's pretty common. Um, so, yeah, you can uh, work to have the film that's located here. Um, digitized. So it'll just be a matter of um, selecting a scope for a project, raising funds, checking on the copyright, all of that. But um, if we have it in our master holdings and you want to partner with us to digitize it, uh, there's a good chance we can just use our master film here. Great. 
All right, partnering, a great idea. All right, well, these were some really great questions. Um, I want to be courteous of people's time, so um, if you have any other questions, I am sure that Donnie um, would be glad to field them. I am also always glad to help uh, with questions where I can. Um, so keep them coming. Um, we hope to hear from you all. Donnie, thank you so much. This was a really informative webinar, and um, we are going to share the link to the recording out as soon as it's available. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so we're going to stop recording and end uh, the webinar. Thank you all so much for attending.